This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash WWII. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash WWII. Quite simply, lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to master Excel, learn negotiation tactics, build a website, or boost your Photoshop skills. Either way, go to lynda.com and feed your curious mind. Some of the courses I would like to recommend are Excel 2013 Power Shortcuts, something you definitely need in this day and age, and Income Tax Fundamentals, something all of us in the U.S. are struggling with now. As for myself, I've been taking lynda.com's courses on web development, web design, um, WordPress, Photoshop, as well as all their app-related courses, because I'm coming out with an app for the World War II podcast. So, you've all been warned. And what I love about it is you can go at your own pace. You can watch the videos over and over, and they do a really good job with their camera angles, the visuals, the audios, nice and clean. So you really do get a sense of what's going on. Again, you can watch it over and over again, like I certainly have. And for the Mrs. History of World War II podcast, she's been taking a lot of the video editing courses because she has decided to take all of her home family movies and just take them to a whole nother level and show them to everyone, whether they want to see them or not. But she's learning a lot and having a good time. And now that I'm doing this recording, I'm going to look on lynda.com and see if I can do anything about really loud birds outside my window while I'm recording. But for the rest of you, please remember that With a lynda.com membership, you can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching, stream thousands of video courses on demand, and learn on your own schedule. Learn at your own pace. Courses are structured so you can watch them from start to finish and consume them in bite-sized pieces. Browse each course transcript to follow along, or search for an answer and skip to that part of the video. That's what I've been doing a lot. Take notes as you go and refer to them later. Download tutorials and watch them on the go, including access on your iOS or Android device. Create and save playlists of courses you want to watch to customize your learning path or share with friends, colleagues, and team members. So, please keep this in mind. Your lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an industry expert, or you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash WWII and sign up for your free 10-day trial. Again, that's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash WWII. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 122, Crete, Part 3. Last time, General Freiburg, the commanding officer of the Allied forces on Crete, believed the war over the island was as good as won. The seaborne reinforcements had been stopped 18 miles short of land, and as he went to bed, the other half of his victory, the counterassault, on the Germans near the Melamey airfield, was about to commence. Earlier that day, May 21st, the 2nd 7th Australian Battalion had finally gotten the word and double-timed it down the road to replace the 20th New Zealand Battalion so they could move against the Germans. Borrowing what vehicles they could, the Aussies' journey was made all the harder as their line of transports attracted the notice of the Luftwaffe. Still, most of the men made the journey. The same could not be said for some of their vehicles. Upon arrival, the Australians immediately got into place. As for the three light tanks attached to the counter-assault, they would be commanded by Lieutenant Roy Farron, who dutifully reported to Puttick. But the Major General, like many of the men, had been up for the last 48 hours, and so asked the tank commander to wait outside his door while he got some sleep. Farron sat down, disgusted, and thought about the coming battle plan. And much of what he thought concerned him. 
There was to be no artillery assault beforehand to soften up the enemy. He was to use three light tanks instead of the much heavier infantry tanks. But after asking around, he was told they had been lost the day before. Fair enough. But then he heard that the Germans had captured two Borforce guns. Exactly what a leader of light tanks did not want to hear. But his last thought, probably as the brigadier emerged from his slumber, was that orders were orders. The two men then finished off the details. The counterattack was to be launched at 0100 during the first hour of May 22nd. But as that time approached, Brigadier Hargest called headquarters twice to ask, did he really have to wait until the whole of the Australian replacements were in place? The answer each time was yes. The Germans may try to come at Kenia again by sea. Keep in mind, there hadn't been a first time. Only by 3 a.m. did the first two companies of the 20th Battalion, so relieved by the Aussies, show up at the starting point, west of the Plantinius River. And at 3.30 a.m. did the assault finally commence. But then everyone involved quickly figured out that even if the fighting between here and the airfield was easy, and it wouldn't be, they would still end up engaging those Germans protecting the airstrip during daylight, when they would be supported by air power. But again, orders were orders. The 28th Battalion, moving along just below the coast road, made steady progress. That's because the closest of the German paratroopers, who had landed the day before, had been flushed out by the 23rd Battalion, and headed for the coast or further south. Which meant, as the advance got underway, the 20th Battalion, above the coast road, came under intensive reactionary fire right away. Vineyards and farmhouses seemed to be stuffed with German paratroops. The right wing immediately became bogged down. But Colonel Kippenberger didn't have time for this. There was a schedule to stick to. So frontal charges were ordered against the Germans. And it was during these attacks that Lieutenant Charles Upham won the first of his two Victoria Crosses. The Germans had been totally unprepared, having already shown a tendency not to engage at night, unless engaged. The New Zealanders rushed in, the Germans, some of them pantsless or bootless, grabbed their guns and returned fire. But in their haste, their shots were high. This gave men like Lieutenant Upham the chance to crawl or run under their fire, getting close, and lob grenades. So the 20th advanced, but lost men along the way. However, not as many as the Germans did. As for the left flank of the 28th Battalion, their way was relatively easy until they got closer to Pyrgos. There the Germans had set up a defense in depth. Machine guns were soon rattling off at the men on point. As for the three light tanks under Ferrum, they would be followed and supported by a small number of men from the 28th, and it wasn't too long before this center section of the Allied line came under attack. Yet Ferm was able to make relatively short work of the resistance in front of him, as his tracers accidentally found the enemy's ammunition dump. There was a huge explosion, and then quiet. The tanks advanced. But before the explosion, the center line had been taking heavy fire. The tanks were fine, but the men supporting the armor started taking casualties. The tanks moved on. By the time they got close to Pyrgos, they were practically without infantry support, but did not know this. And then they entered the town. Coming around one corner, the lead tank was hit by a Boer first gun, then was hit again. The gunner was dead, the tank commander mortally wounded. The driver had most of one foot removed, but still managed to operate the machine. He backed the tank away from enemy fire. Farron himself gave the wounded commander morphine as he was screaming from the pain. His pain subsided, but the man died soon after. By now, it was daylight, the result being the sky was now full of German aircraft, buzzing the men and trying to line up the two remaining tanks. Farron's tank was targeted first. Bombs were landing all about him. He knew he would be dead soon if nothing changed. 
So he drove straight into a bamboo field for cover. Yet the strong plants immediately broke one of his wheels. Men were sent back a ways to get a wheel from the first tank with the now dead crew. The wheels were switched, but by then a strafing gun caused the bamboo to catch fire. The tank survived this, mostly, but was now again out in the open. Farron knew his damaged tank would not survive the rest of the way, and leaving one tank to anchor the center would be suicide. So the tanks were ordered back, but not the men. Back in Pyrgos, A and C Company of the 20th Battalion were finding that house-to-house fighting was a losing game without tank support, and the Germans were toying with them. As some Germans were stationed in the houses or buildings, others were following along with the battle along the rooftops, dropping grenades on the New Zealanders, who were so focused on what was behind the next door or the next wall, they couldn't see what was happening. Hoping to keep the advance alive, some of the men from the 28th, further south, swung around Pyrgos and made for the base of Hill 107. But then they were bogged down by intensive defensive fire. Both sides charged at each other, rifles flashing, bayonets glistening. It was war at its ugliest and bravest. No tactics, no subterfuge, just a surging desire to kill. But the 28th was checked. Then came the strafing from the air and the shells from the airbase. Spent and dying or wounded in quick succession, their advance was done. The only unit to match the 28th's success, as in making it this far west, was D Company of the 20th Battalion. They were the most northern unit, practically running along the beach. Though taking losses, D Company made it to the northeast corner of the airfield. But once they started firing directly at the planes, they and the Germans realized the attackers had nothing to hide behind, besides tall bamboo. Fortunately, B Company soon showed up at the airfield, just in time to get caught in the crossfire of the strafing of German fighters, ramps and machine guns on the airfield, and larger guns from Hill 107. This advance, too, ground to a halt. For the next hour, no new ground was taken, but the wounded were certainly increasing. Clearly, something had to give if the counterattack was to have any chance of success. With this in mind, Colonel Dittmer of the 28th Battalion radioed Colonel Leckie and Lieutenant Colonel Andrew asking for help from the 23rd Battalion and the 22nd Battalion, respectfully. But these two men, by this point, were of one mind, that they, the collective they, had done all they could. No, it was time to consolidate, which makes no sense in the middle of a counterattack to clean up what they had and allow the Germans to continue to fly in reinforcements at their own undisturbed pace. The men all along the front were told to stand firm, not to advance any further, as if that was possible, with no tank support or reinforcements. But it was soon in doubt if even this was going to work, as three fresh companies from the German 85th Mountain Regiment's 2nd Battalion was thrown into the mix. Now, throughout the early morning counterattack, German planes continued to land and unload reinforcements and supplies. Meanwhile, the nine Italian guns captured in North Africa continued to fire on them. The Germans were taking a heavy toll, but winning the numbers game. In fact, one squadron had lost 37 aircraft, confirmed by a German message picked up by Ultra. Still, as the day went by, there were more Germans on the island than before. And here is where the story of Operation Mercury leaves reality and head straight for Neverland. By late morning, reports were being sent back to Brigadier Hargest, who reported to his superiors that many aircraft were landing at Melame, and men were seen rushing to them, or in his words, amazingly, quote, it appears as though the enemy might be preparing evacuation, unquote. But the truth was, the men rushing to the plane were not getting on board, but unloading ammo, food, and medicine. Within a few hours, the truth made itself plain, even to Hargest. 
His spirits fell, and he reported that his men were too exhausted for any more action that day. Yet one can't help but think his emotional state and his view of his own men were somehow linked. Not until 5 p.m. that day of May 22nd was Freiburg told that the counterattack had failed. The general, probably glancing out to sea, suddenly realized either he had been wrong about the seaborne attack, or, more likely, was tricked. But either way, the only threat now were those Germans to his west. They had to be removed. So, he then ordered another counterattack. This one was to be carried out by two fresh battalions, this time from the 4th Brigade the 2nd 8th Australian, and the 18th New Zealand battalions. But this order, in the next few hours, would come to nothing. In fact, it would not only be reversed, but the still fresh troops of the 5th Brigade and those that were still just east of the Melamey Airfield, that is, D Company of the 20th Battalion of the 5th Brigade, which had, without tank support, brushed the airfield's northeast corner that very morning, would be ordered back to the Plantinius River. And this order effectively ended Freiburg's goal of pushing the Germans from the landing zone, and, to a larger degree, his defense of Crete. The ancient philosophers said that true happiness comes from within. Well, obviously, they never played Best Fiends. This free-to-download game has it all, fun characters, new challenges, and thousands of puzzles to play. Whenever I have a few minutes, I bring it up, and I carry on with my quest to get to level 1,000 before my wife does. The competition in our house is fierce, more fiendish, and bragging rights are everything. I'm currently on level 87, so I have a ways to go, but that's part of the fun. The gathering of cute characters is my fave by far. I love the artwork, and you can play Best Fiends without an internet connection, once you download it, and know that every win brings new challenges and new in-game events are added all the time. So let enough is never enough be your mantra. Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. It would be more exact to say that, when Major General Puttock met with Brigadier Hargest, the latter informed the former, in no uncertain terms, that the men of the 5th Brigade, already committed, were exhausted and unable to hold much longer what ground they had captured. Moreover, the fresh units of the 5th were not battle-worthy. Their morale had been lowered by the failed counterattack. Again, one can easily argue the connection between Hargest's embarrassment over his earlier reports, his dejected outlook on the entire enterprise, and his report to Puttock about the state of his men. All this meant that the two battalions of the 4th Brigade would be acting on their own in the upcoming counterattack, clearly a job beyond their means, given their numbers, but more importantly, beyond their means relative to the number of Germans now in the field, as of the day's latest landings. Puttock reported to headquarters his recommendation that the 5th be pulled back to the river, which negated sending the men of the 4th forward. This recommendation was in Freiburg's hands by 7 p.m. But instead of a tirade in paper form with exclamation marks about questioning his orders or about the whole reason they were here in the first place was to stop the Germans from obtaining the island, there came instead from Freiburg nothing. Silence. But it must be said that there were other events that day that helped nudge Puttock to make his recommendation that went unchallenged by Freiburg. Puttock had been getting reports about German troop movements just north of the Prison Valley and Galatis, which is just off the coast road and between Kenia and the Plantinius River, the starting point of the last offensive. It made little sense to the Major General to launch an offensive at the Germans around the airfield to his west when there were other Germans to his southwest. To send an attacking force west, only to have the southern Germans come north and so cut off his counterattack, was the equivalent of killing those men himself. 
Pollock would no more want to face Freiburg in losing so many of his own countrymen than Freiburg would want to face his own government for being the man in charge when possibly two brigades worth might be killed or captured, only then to lose the island anyway. And the German threat from the south was a very real thing. For the last 24 hours, the Germans around the prison valley had not only been trying to link up with, or at least make contact with, their comrades much near the airfield, or Hill 107, but they had also been trying to gather what surviving paratroops had landed relatively near them during the last jump, the second day of the battle, to increase their numbers. Captain von der Heidt, an officer among the Germans to the southwest, later wrote that on May 22nd he knew their supplies were low, but if either Pink or Cemetery Hill could be taken, they would then be, via their position, threatening the coast road, and so hopefully hold the Allies up from attacking towards the airfield, which would allow reinforcements to come in unhindered. So Major Derpa was given the assignment of taking Pink Hill, which, if successful, would not only check those Allied forces on Cemetery Hill to its east, but also the city of Galatas, which, if also taken, would directly threaten the coast road. But Derpa, knowing their limited amount of everything, commented that to his superior, that just by holding their current position, they threatened Kenia already, and the area to their north, that part of the coast road to the west of Kenia. It was only a matter of time before the mountain division landed enough troops to surge their way, allow them to link up and resupply the depleted southern troops. Then together they could take Kenia and Suda Bay. This was militarily prudent. But to Derpa's superior, Colonel Heinrich, it sounded like cowardice. And he said as much. Derpa stiffened to attention and saluted, probably to give his hand something to do instead of striking his accuser. And he said that, I am considering the lives of the soldiers for who I am responsible. My life I would give gladly. But Derpa had his orders. So, taking his men, he rushed Pink Hill and managed to reach the top, and even set up several machine gun emplacements. Brigadier Kippenberger, the ranking Allied man on the scene, was about to throw in his last reserves at the hilltop, when he heard the most horrid of screams, coming from hundreds of throats. Turning, Kippenberger and von der Heidt, but through binoculars, watched stunned and amazed as Captain Forrester, an eccentric British officer, came forward, in shorts, with no helmet, and a pistol, blowing on a whistle, set firmly in his mouth. About twenty yards behind him were four hundred or so Greeks and Cretans, including women, who were about to conduct a bayonet charge at the machine gun teams. According to Kippenberger, their cry was eerie. It chilled his blood. Forrester couldn't talk directly to the Greeks or Cretans, but he had taught them a few actions based on different whistle signals. The tune he was tooting now was, charge right at the buggers, and no mistake. As for the Germans, they took one look at this domestic mob and hightailed it off the hilltop. But not in time. Some were caught up to and slain. Major Derpa was one of the casualties. Yet all this would count for nothing, since the 5th Brigade was about to pull back, which would allow the Germans, when they came east from the airfield, to link up with the Germans around the prison valley, who had not been reinforced or resupplied since day one. The other setback that shook Puttock and his brother officers was the blow that fell on the Royal Navy that same day. Admiral Cunningham was determined that no German reinforcements would make it to Crete by sea. This was, of course, sound policy, but it's worth asking if he was ever informed of Freiburg's strong doubts about the Royal Navy in fulfilling its protective role regarding the island. Either way, when the Admiral was told a second flotilla of Keikis was en route to the island, having recently left the island of Milos, almost due north of Suda Bay, he sent in Force C, led by Rear Admiral King, to stop them. 
King took his three cruisers and four destroyers and first headed to Heraklion, in case the Germans were headed there, but then, not seeing any enemy vessels, turned northwest and made for Milos to catch the flotilla en route. Around 8.30 a.m. that morning, a single keiki was spotted and sunk by the Australian cruiser Perth. German aircraft were overhead, but as the cruiser came in closer to its intended victim, the pilots above dared not bomb near their own men. However, that was no longer a concern after the smaller naval vessel, loaded down with German troops, disappeared. Instead, the JU-88s went after the cruiser HMS Nyad, and only then went after Perth. Both ships dodged the bombs as best they could and continued toward Milos. A half an hour later, the cruiser Calcutta spotted a transport and sunk that as well, but itself then came to the attention of the Luftwaffe. The ships under King moved on, coming ever closer to Milos. When they were about 25 miles away, the Italian escort, Sagittario, was spotted leading a small pack of keikis. But once the transport ships spotted the British ships coming upon them, the smaller ships turned to make good their escape as the Sagittario laid down smoke. Meanwhile, the German bombers overhead continued their assault on the attacking ships. King then had to make the call. Did he attack the troop canoes and deal with the planes as best he could, or did he turn and save his force for another day? After all, the Keikis were turning away from Crete. That part of his mission was accomplished, and his ships were already running low on anti-aircraft fire, having engaged the planes since morning. King decided to pull away. Cunningham, when he was later informed of this, stormed that the safest place to be was among the Keikis, but that didn't answer the question what to do once they were all sunk, or otherwise, why stay in the area at all. Not that King's decision suddenly removed his ships from the area, nor did away with the German aircraft overhead. Nayid was damaged, and the cruiser Carlisle suffered a direct hit. But the fleet continued on with its withdrawal, its speed determined by the slowest ship. So too did the attacks from above continue. Almost four hours later, King's ships were met by Rear Admiral Rawlings of Force A-1. What's more, the battleships Warspite and Valiant were en route as well, coming from the Kithara Channel to the west. The ideal was for the battleships to offer themselves up as targets too tempting for the bombers to ignore. The plan worked, and soon the battleships were taking the brunt of German air power. By now, there were just over 300 German aircraft in the area. The Warspite suffered a direct hit, and the destroyer Greyhound was sunk, but only after it sank a larger-than-average Keiki. King responded to the Greyhound by sending in two ships to pick up the survivors, while two other ships, the Gloucester and the Fiji, provided covering fire. But again, they were running even lower now on anti-air fire of which King was soon informed. But by then, the men of the Gloucester and Fiji were in the thick of it, wanting to do their part. More German planes came on. A target-rich area such as this was not to be missed. While the planes were waiting their turn to dive down on the ships, they strafed those stranded in the water. Having been given orders to leave, the Gloucester made best speed, but it couldn't outrun airplanes. The ship was hit several more times, the result being it was soon barely moving. By now, the Gloucester nor its men could be helped, and King and Rawlings decided together not to risk the rest of the fleet to save one already doomed ship. The rest sailed away, and the Gloucester was hit again. Its men in the water were strafed and bombed repeatedly. Some 722 officers and men were assumed dead. The two naval forces continued in their southwesterly direction, but the Germans weren't done. Who knew when they would get another chance like this? The battleship Valiant was hit twice, and a few hours later, the Fiji was hit. The Fiji's propellers stopped completely as its engine room was flooded with water. But just before dark, a lone Ju-88 on its fourth mission of that day flew past some of the other damaged ships, 
and dropped three bombs on the Fiji, which rolled over and sank. Of the 500 or so from the crew that were not killed outright, they were picked up later that night by two destroyers, Kingston and Kandahar. By the end of the day, the Mediterranean fleet had lost two cruisers and one destroyer, with two battleships, two cruisers, and numerous destroyers damaged and in need of repair before engaging the enemy again. Yet those losses were for nothing. The Battle of Crete had already been determined. Though all the details were not known to Puttock, he heard of the hard time the Navy was having and believed, like Freiburg, there was only so much their nautical comrades could do. So, when he ordered the brigades back, it was with this naval disaster and the costly failed counterattack firmly in his mind. This is probably why Freiburg did not contest his decision. That evening, General Ringel, General Student's replacement, arrived on the island, and with him was a large fighter force. Those fighters were to protect his offensive against the Allies, now that their counterattack had petered out. Ringel immediately got to work. What forces he had were broken into three groups. The first group, a battalion of mountain troops, under the command of Major Schott, were to head for Castelli, to the far west. That area was to be made safe for the landing of tanks. The second group consisted of pair troops around the Melemé airfield. They were put under ramp and would go on defending the all-important airfield. The third group, made up of the remaining pair troops under Colonel Utz, would head east towards Kania, but just off of the coast road, and see what could be done as concerning the Allied positions there and or the Germans to the south of the coast road. Whether the main push was to come along the coast road or further south remained to be seen. But Utz was about to get a helping hand from Freiburg. Just after midnight on May 23rd, the orders to withdraw were finalized. Word was sent to the 23rd Battalion headquarters under Lecky, who was told to make for Plantinius. Lecky was shocked by the news, but had already missed his chance over the last two days, to move more of his men into the fray, but chose not to. No matter, once word got around about the withdrawal, what fighting spirit remained in those men most forward vanished, replaced with defeatism. So, as happened on Greece, the wounded were moved out first. But it was the 28th Battalion, the ones who had bled and fought more than most south of the coast road, that were given rearguard duty. Lieutenant Colonel Dittmer, who had showed true leadership, later commented that he just knew he and his were going to catch hell, as the Germans would be pressing them hard. And he was right. He lost more men. But on three separate occasions, his men turned and charged the Germans, pushing them back, and then, each time, engaged in a running battle. But they did their job. So, that morning of May 23rd, the disengaging and falling back started. Those captured nine Italian artillery pieces that had been shelling the airfield with such great results were also pulled back and would be, once they reached their destination, out of range of the airfield. The landing strip was made safe for the Germans. By two o'clock that afternoon, the withdrawal to Plantinius was complete Earlier that day, Churchill wired to Freiburg, The whole world is watching your splendid battle, on which great events turn. But then the Prime Minister wrote a lot more curtly to Wavell, Crete must be won, even if the enemy has secured good lodgments. Is it not possible to send more tanks and thus reconquer any captured aerodrome? But that phase of the Battle of Crete had already passed. All that Freiburg, and thus the Allies, could hope for would be to stretch out their defeat, try to control what form it took, lasting, holding out until Germany attacked Russia, if what they had gleaned from Ultra was true. Epilogue The Gloucester was assumed lost with all hands, yet about 500 men were picked up by the Italians 
and Germans. They were now POWs. As for the ship's captain, his body washed up on shore at Mercer Matru four weeks later. One of the lifeboats from the vessel Greyhound held 20 men. One man among them spotted a German plane coming down at them, so jumped overboard. When he resurfaced, everyone else was dead. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I just want to say hi and thank some people for their donations to me. And then at the end of this, I have some really good news for everyone. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to say hello to my latest members, Michael P. from New York, New York, Bill P. from California, who also listens to the Caesar podcast, and I think he's from Yorba Linda, California, who wants to be called Maximus Californicus, so good for you, Bill. Uh, Mark L. from Little Shoot, Wisconsin, Daniel A. from Presto, UK, I hope I said that right, Daryl W. from Lakeville, Minnesota, Minnesota, and Jeff C., as far as donations, I'd like to thank Richard W. from Wildomar, California. And for my mug purchasers, I'd like to thank Ashley H. from Sugar Hill, Georgia, who not only bought mugs before, but also bought another Churchill mug and an FDR mug. And I have to share this one last story with you. There's this uh, lovely lady named Shannon in, in uh, Toronto, California. She bought a Churchill mug for her husband, John. He, after not too long, broke it, I'm sure accidentally. Then she bought him another one. Alas, he just recently broke that, so now she's uh, ordering another one from me. So if, if no one else orders a mug in this entire world, I have a huge supply just ready for John to go in his probably klutzy fingers. I hope he's not a surgeon. So Shannon and John, thank you very much. And I just want to let you all know that the next episode, the next regular episode, will be out in three days. So I'll see you again on the 18th. Take care, everyone.